Hi everybody, Eve Harrow, Director of Tourism and Community Development for One Israel Fund. We are sitting near Tel Shiloh, just under the modern town of Shiloh and near the ancient town of Shiloh. And that of course is where the tabernacle, where the Mishkan was for the entire period of the judges. And we are sitting now in Kaduma, the studio of Suri Provisor, who is an expert in the ancient crafts. Hi guys, welcome to Kaduma. Welcome Eve to Kaduma. I'm so glad you came to visit. The meaning of the word Kaduma is um, to go back in time. Instead of Kadima, I sort of made up the word. Kadima means to go forward, and the word Kadu means to go back. So I made the center to get that feeling of what it used to be like, you know, how we used to sit together and work together in our villages and do all these crafts together. One of the ways that I got connected um, with all these crafts is I needed the Tanakh to be more alive for me. It was all very quiet and dormant in its pages and I was always looking for the life. I had studied archaeology and while studying archaeology it was like very dusty and I could never really, except for an imprint of some rug in Jericho, you know, you could get an image of how people used to live and all of the fibers and basketry and clothing is the stuff that didn't make it through time. All we see is the his story is all of the stones and the glass and all of these hard materials, but the soft materials did not remain. And working in Tel Shiloh for a long time, I really wanted to get the feel and show it to people because as a result of that, I started making like um, biblical streets and bringing in all sorts of arts, crafts people. And um, by doing this, just getting people to feel, I think you could feel the Tanakh more strongly. And um, I picked this up in my travels, like when I was traveling around the world in just different primitive places, you just see these things are still very alive. And all the stuff that we've lost in Judaism, you can find it hiding in other cultures. In other primitive poor cultures, it still have to live this way. But we can get this um, knowledge back again. I'm intrigued by what you said, that the soft things didn't survive the time. And these, I suppose you could say, were considered like women's work. Right, the, the so, her story, or like the softer gender, who worked very, very hard. But you said that Judaism lost this, but for those of us who keep a traditional Shabbat, so we still keep this idea of the things that we don't do, or that it's extrapolated, like electricity, that's extrapolated. So how do you teach people about these melachot? How do you teach people in the very place where the tabernacle stood for hundreds of years, how do you connect people to that idea of what it means to create? It's, it's known as a day of rest, but it really me means a day where you don't work, where you don't create. How do you parse that difference? Mm -hmm, correct. Um, the, what is left in Judaism today is the avot melacha, is the toldot. The avot melacha are the original melachot, which nobody really spins wool anymore, or they don't comb their wool, but we're left with the the toladot of the original melacha. For instance, combing wool, the original melacha, the original craft was combing. Um, all we're left with from that melacha really is not combing hair with a comb on Shabbat. That's our residue of that melacha. So the problem with it in today's Judaism, I feel, is that it almost seems trivial. You know, the things that we don't do, we don't understand even where they're coming from. What do you mean don't comb your hair? Why shouldn't I comb my hair? You know, and when you get to the root of it, you could see how deep and beautiful it is. It's all about a process, taking from nothing and creating until the end process. For instance, making the bread, the melachot of making the bread, it doesn't start from kneading, pouring your flour from the supermarket. It comes from planting the seeds and winnowing the grains, and it keeps going on and on. And each of the melachot, each category is really the entire process. The leather making, you're starting in not killing the animal. You know, so I believe that the melachot are things that come from the ground up. And from there, we really learn the beauty of the shefa of the world, of the bounty of the world that God has given us. And us, we come in, what man can do is with our ability and knowledge and hands, we can do this whole process. It's we have to be the go-between to do to do this. So to me, that's what an actual craft is. It's not taking glue from the craft store and sticking it on. That, that's not a craft. A craft, as a, as a melacha, I think a craft is something that starts from the bottom. You know, it's the bottom up and we are part of that process. The temple had a lot, a lot of cloths in it. The Mishkan had a tremendous amount of fabric going on in there. That's pretty much how man used to live. You know, we just had to 
do this whole process in order to have tents and rugs and, and everything in our, in our own house. So for the Mishkan, let's look at the fabrics from the Mishkan. We have the outer walls were made from spun goat's hair and the top was made from, from skins and more blue, more blue fabric, which could have been woven, could have been dyed leather. The inside we had all of the, the um, the, um, the partitions in the middle, the parochot, um, all of the coverings of everything, all the walls, and, and the, also the clothing, the clothing, the bigde kiuna, the priest clothing, where everything is, is all woven. So the, the colors, the colors in the Mishkan, we talk about trelet argaman and shani, right? So it's not that God liked blue and purple and red, you know, most of the common people walked around in colors like this. These are things that you could get. These are vegetable dyes. You can get it from all kinds of plants growing. This is from turmeric. This is from onion skins, all kinds of nut hulls and berries. Um, you couldn't get trelet argaman and chani. You couldn't get the crimson and the blue. That was not common at all. Those were colors just for the very, very wealthy. So if you'd see a guy walking in with a blue robe, it would be like a movie star walked in the room. That would be our same reaction. Wow, who's that? You know, because if we're all walking around like that, and all of a sudden some guy comes in like this, and you're like, whoa. So this is an important thing for us to understand, is that in the ancient world, these colors were very, very uncommon. The blue, the, these colors, these crimsons and blues and purples, these were status symbols in the ancient world. So I'm going to show you a couple things. This would be vegetable dyes. These are walnut holes and sumac. And that's the basic things for the peasants. So that's what they'd be walking around with. The, re, the royalty, okay, this is the chilazon that the blue has gotten from. Okay, the shell is, um, the animal actually is pierced here. And with this gland, when it touches the air and oxidizes, the white liquid from here turns blue. It's a complex process how this was dyed. It's amazing that they got to this. There were actually secrets in that world. Nobody could tell anybody how the blue was made. So the trelet was also very complex, very, very expensive. This was very rare. You needed thousands of these to dye like a ounce, so they say. Um, the red is very interesting too. Okay, this is a bug called cochineal. Okay, um, I'm just gonna show you the type of bug. This is not the actual shani that it's um, actually not happening anymore, but this is a great story because this cochineal grows on sabra plants, okay? And when they wanted in Israel, in early Israel, they wanted the red dye. So they imported the sabra plant from Mexico and planted it in Israel in order to grow the cochineal. So the sabra is not really native to Israel, which is pretty amusing. But um, this bug is used actually in, as food coloring in some countries in the world. So it's actually, that's the unkosher red that you see, but I want to show you how this works. So this gives us, this is a very rare um, red bug dye. When we speak now about cardinal red, mm -hmm. like a color that also is used Look by it. other religions, that's where, the, that's where this comes from, um, this idea? Yes, this actually the red coats used to wear this in England. Okay, it usually comes out to a really, really bright red, but yeah. Look at that. <laughs> So that's, that's, you can get an understanding of the specialness of Trelet Argaman and Shani, these colors that were used in the temple, which, um, you know, we usually just look at it as like, nobody even asks, really. Nobody even asks why you wanted those colors, but, you know, to understand that those are colors of royalty. It's basically, we read about our avot, our forefathers, and they were shepherds. They were raising sheep. So they were raising it for meat and for the wool. So that is the, those are the materials that are basically used in the Mishkan. That and what is the other fiber that we don't usually mix, shatnez. I'll show you that linen. in a minute. Okay, linen, that's right. I'm gonna show you in a minute. Okay, so this is a prepared wool fiber. Okay, and this is ready for spinning. It can also be cleaned. This is hamalbin, this is after it's cleaned. We'll show you there, a little easier to work with. Okay, look at that difference. Okay, so look at the difference. This is like a fiber wool before it's cleaned and combed. I mean, well, it's combed, but it's not cleaned yet. And this is how white it gets. From this phase, after I've taken out all that lanolin, all of the oils, this is in a state where I can dye it. In this state, it cannot take any color. In this state, it can. I'm gonna show you quickly how to use, how it's spun. These are the open fibers, okay? Now, what's spinning really all about? Hatove. 
basically taking these fibers, these open fibers, and I'm twisting them. That's how you make thread. That's basically all that's happening on spinning wheels. Big machines, I'm just twisting the thread. You know that old song, Eshet Chayil, that we sing on Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Who understands any of the words of that song? <laughs> we just kind of sing the words, don't we? <laughs> okay, so when you get to the words, Yada Shilcha Bakishor, V'kapeo Tamchu Falich. Okay, her hands are holding the spindle. And this is what our foremothers used to do at their time. Just like they still do in primitive countries, but I am opening the fibers, releasing them, and bringing the spin up, and making the thread. There's what seems like a very strange and even esoteric prohibition, which is not mixing linen and wool. Suri has an idea on why that could be. Um, yeah, we talk about shotness, mixing linen and wool is something, this mysterious custom that we can't really know the answer. But um, working with wool and linen and spinning and understanding fibers, I came to understand that there really is a very big difference between these two fibers. Now wool and um, what else do we have? Llama wool, sheep wool, um, camel wool, Angora, all these things come from animals, okay? These are animal fibers. They're all protein animal fibers. And, um, and then we have the plant world. The plant world would be cotton, linen, hemp. Um, nettles are starting to become fashionable, but all those things come from the animal world. And mixing them together is mixing two worlds together, sort of like meat and milk would be mixing life and death together. So this concept of mixing two worlds um, there's something, there's some kind of energy that this brings about. In the temple, we're actually commanded to mix linen and wool for the Kohanim's clothes, for all of the outer, the Kohanim, the high priest's clothes, and the walls of the, the partitions. We're actually commanded to do this, and I feel like in this place specifically is where the worlds can be blended because it's, it's for holiness, it's for a higher purpose where all is one, really. So anyway, this is um, linen. Whoever sees linen, right? Okay, this, look how this works. It's like really amazing. Nobody even does this anymore. Maybe a little bit in Europe. But this is the linen. It grows very tall. Okay? And when I break open the fibers, there's a whole process in getting the fibers to this place where it can... Look at this. And these are linen threads. Look at that. It's like so strong and long. And this... Um, this fiber, because it's much longer than a wool fiber, I'm gonna keep it in two different hands that I don't mix, okay? Much shorter fiber than this. This is the length of the fiber, and this is the length of the linen fiber. So this used to be put onto a stick. All this would be wound onto a stick. The stick is called a distaff, and that's another thing that we sing, sing about in Eshet Chayil, is Yada Shilcha Bakishor. Her hand was extended to the distaff, and she would pull the threads from the distaff and use it on her spindle. And her hands would spin the spindle. So this, all of this stuff really, for me, brought Judaism more living and alive and understandable and something that I could relate to. So I hope this inspires you, you know? Just, it's really a beautiful. There's so much beauty inside of this that we miss. We just don't see it. It's this thing that we say, Please um, open the eyes of the blind. So this is what all of this was for me when I started discovering all these things. I was like, amazing. So much more than I gave it credit for. I'm here in Tel Shiloh in a recently constructed building with a model of the Mishkan behind me, of the tabernacle behind me, as part of a fantastic hologram presentation that they have to show us that the Mishkan is much more than we thought it was, and it had many, many secrets. You know, we just sat with Shuri Provisor, learning some of the ancient crafts, and people who still do that in the world, and she mentioned she's been to some of these places, what she calls primitive societies, but sometimes I think to myself, they were able to do things that many of us can't do. I can't make my own clothes, I can't grow my own food. When my electricity goes out or I don't have Wi-Fi for a few minutes, I'm like beside myself. And what do I do with my refrigerator? And what they had that many of us don't have or don't have enough of is faith. There was no such thing as an atheist in the ancient world. 
Everybody understood that there were bigger things going on and that nature and the vastness of the world we could use, we could create with, but there was a time to also leave it alone because it didn't belong to us. Just understanding that not everything is ours, but the world belongs to God. And you can come here to Shiloh and you can come to Suri's workshop and with your hands and your mind and your heart and soul, come to a different kind of an understanding of where we all come from and that they had a wisdom that we need to find and incorporate into our own.